Um, I, I think many of you you know Dr. Jenkins from his um, his cameo appearance yesterday, and uh, I won't reintroduce him except to say that he's an associate professor at Emory and, and a longtime supporter and uh, contributor of, of his um, work and wisdom to the Hypersomnia Foundation's mission. And the only thing that I didn't say yesterday, and I, I heard him referred to as um, the John Oliver of the sleep world. <laughs> so um, this, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting to see how, it, how this actually plays out on, on stage. But uh, I'll um, let you take over. Andy, you can take the handheld, or this is also on. Thank but you. No pacing. <clears throat> no, no I'm going to be holding on. Oh, Jesus I'm, I'm staying here. I'm not moving. <laughs> A nice leather armchair and a pipe or something, have a fireside chat. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone, for getting out of bed early on a, uh, on a Sunday morning. It's difficult at the best of times, but let alone if you're living with the brain fog of IH. So I thank you all for, for struggling down here uh, this morning. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the crazy guy who, who for the first, the first person to put hypersomnic CSF on a GABA receptor and then co-apply um, flamazenil. That was some 10, 12 years ago. It takes my breath away to see so many people in a room together, all taking that, that interesting little benzodiazepine antagonist. So uh, um, as you'll hear, I'm a physicist by training. I should be nowhere near patients. Um, to have impacted so many lives in such a short period of time, it, it gives me goosebumps and my voice is breaking up. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on to the talk. Um, first of all, my... Uh, my, my professional relationships um, with industry. Uh, together with Dave Rye, um, we have successfully prosecuted, prosecuted a patent um, that's now been uh, licensed to Balance Pharma, um, and that is now taking flamazole into a broader um, uh, uh, <coughs> community, um, something we can't do as scientists. We don't have um, industrialization uh, capabilities in our, in our labs, so um, thank you, Pharma, for picking that up. And for the first time, my scientific ideas are actually uh, garnering some, 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 some money. So um, very generously, Balanced Pharma have paid us uh, uh, $7,000 each. So um, I'm still working out what to do with it. Um, why am I here? Um, I'll just give you a bit of my background. How does a biophysicist end up investigating uh, sleep medicine? Well, I went to neurotree.org, and I put my name in and linked myself to my, uh, my advisors. Um, <clears throat> Um, I did my postdocs with, uh, with Neil Harrison, who's now at Columbia, and he is the um, uh, great-great-grandchild, if you like, of Sir Charles Scott Sherrington and Sir John Eccles. These guys basically discovered and developed the whole idea is about synaptic inhibition. So I am a, a, a scientific descendant of, 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 of uh, Sherrington and Eccles. Um, through his other um, advisor, Mike Simmons, through Neil, you go up the tree and you find Julius Axelrod, so famous for uh, discovering catecholamines. Also, he did uh, pioneering work on the role of the pineal gland and, uh, and controlled the wake sleep cycle. So there's my sleep background, my synaptic inhibition, my biophysicist, as I said. If you go up my, other, my final uh, ladder of my tree, I'm actually quite honored to have my thesis advisor in the room. So I'm going to be a little bit more nervous today than usual. Make sure I don't mess up. Dr. Nick Franks. Um, and if you trace Nick's uh, lineage, you go up to, he was trained by Morris Wilkins, who won the Nobel Prize for, for discovering the structure of DNA, who in turn was uh, the great-great-grandchild of Lord Rutherford, who split the atom, and J.J. Thompson, who split the, uh, who discovered the, uh, the electron. So um, between physics and sleep and synaptic inhibition, it kind of, it's not, not really a surprise that I am here today looking at the biophysics of sleep on ion channels. So um, what do I want to talk about today? Um, the next um, half an hour or so, I'm going to go right back to the basics. When I gave a similar talk to this four years ago, I think I lost everyone in the first five minutes. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so we're going back to some real basics. How do our brain cells communicate with one another? And how do drugs and disease alter that? We're going to spend some time discussing what is GABA precisely? Why is it inhibitory? And why does it play an important role in IH? And by the end, um, um, we'll to uh, discuss how can we relieve the symptoms of hypersomnia with drugs working at GABA receptors, and what am I going to be doing for the next five or ten years to try and uh, make some progress in discovering um, how this disease uh, uh, can be alleviated or eradicated. So, take home messages. A lot of these, we're going to work through them, then we're going to repeat them in the second part of the talk. Our brain contain, brains contain many, many cells called neurons. These cells are responsible for sending and receiving chemical messages um, in the brain. 
And neurons use synapses to communicate um, with one another. They use synapses to send these chemical messages and to receive these chemical messages. Um, and within these small structures called synapses, there are receptors. Um, synapses use receptors to capture these chemical messages and interpret them. And so these little chemical message, messages we're going to call neurotransmitters. So neurons down to synapses, down to receptors, and neurotransmitters. Now these chemical messages can have two different, two distinct functions. They can be excitatory. One cell can tell the next cell to go, fire, do something. So we can have excitatory uh, uh, neurotransmitters. Or they can do the opposite. They can tell the next cell down the chain to stop. Don't fire, don't do something. So these will be inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters. And neurons use many different kinds of chemicals to send stop signals or go signals. And as you probably know, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's this chemical stop signal in the brain. Um, GABA binds to GABA A receptors. There are GABA B receptors as well, but we're just going to focus on GABA A. Um, and receptors, in more detail, these are proteins that bind these chemical messages. But after they've bound it, the receptor will change shape. It'll change its, uh, uh, its relationship to its surroundings. And by doing that, it can change, uh, initiate change within that neuron. GABA-A receptors also happen to be ion channels. They have receptors on them, and they have an integral ion channel. And so they, they let negative ions into the cell. So in this flow of negative ions, this flow of uh, uh, negative charge into the cell is going to help inhibit uh, neuronal activity. And I want to talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, GABA-A receptors are also very, very important drug targets. Um, <clears throat> anxiolytics like Valium bind directly to GABA-A receptors to elicit their principal um, effects. Drugs like Ambien, sleep aids, these also bind to GABA-A receptors. And GABA-A receptor is one of several very important targets for general anesthetic drugs like propofol or isoflurane. Now, these, all three of these drug classes do not activate the receptor. I'll be really clear about this. They're, they're what we call PANs, positive allosteric modulators. They're going to bind to the receptor, and they're going to change the way it works, but they don't actually activate it very much. And what I mean by uh, PAM is having a positive effect. They're going to make this receptor just work harder. And so with a GABA, if you have a PAM on a GABA receptor, that's going to make more inhibition in the brain. And that's going to be central to our thesis this morning. Because <clears throat> in IH, your brains contain an additional signal. Your brains are making a PAM. And it's making your GABA receptors work harder. <clears throat> Your brain experiences more inhibition if you have IH. Um, <clears throat> and because this protein in the brain in IH is a GABA-PAM, its effects are, can be similar to low concentrations of Valium or Ambien or Propofol. So we are working very hard, and you'll see at the end, um, we're identifying um, these signals, <clears throat> and we're looking for strategies for controlling it to bring bringing sleepy people back into a, uh, to look normal levels of arousal. Right, so that was lots of information for 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Let's go back and, uh, and review what I mean by, by uh, some, some of these interesting terms we don't use in everyday conversation. So, <clears throat> 85 billion cells on average in the human brain. Okay? Each cell will have a nucleus, has an axon. <clears throat> it has its own dendritic field over here. These are the ears of the cell listening for, for signals, chemical signals coming in. Um, at the other end, we have these presynaptic terminals that contact the next neuron in, in the chain. We'll look at a little animation of that in a second. Um, this slide is here just for beauty. I think this is one of the most gorgeous uh, images I saw early in my training, and uh, it's uh, Cajal's uh, uh, staining of, 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 uh, of neurons um, back in the 1950s. And this is in this library uh, image, beautiful image of a cell body and these arbors and axons coming off of the, 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 uh, the, new, the, the cell body itself. Right, so <clears throat> what is so special about a neuron? Let's get down to basics. Right, every cell in the body has a wall. It's one known as a membrane. And this acts as a barrier to water and to salts. What do I mean by that? Well, ooh, that's changed. Um, Let's think about common table salt, sodium chloride. When you dissolve that into water, it separates out into its different ions. A so positive sodium ion and 
be negative chloride ion. In a cell, you're going to find some chloride on the outside, some chloride on the inside. But that membrane will stop that chloride from flowing in one direction or another. It's a barrier. Those chloride ions can bounce around on the outside, on the inside, but they can't cross from one place to another. In order for that to happen, the cell has to express an ion channel, a protein that sits in that cell wall that allows those ions to flow across the membrane. Okay? Once that, part, that channel is open, the laws of physics will just push these ions one way or the other. In this, this cartoon, you've got less ions on the inside on the outside, so nature's going to want to push those ions into the cell until there's the same number on either side. Okay? And that's how ion channels work. Of course, in a real neuron, <clears throat> you're going to have a whole bunch of these but, uh, channels that are selected for sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions, calcium, and so on and so, so forth. <clears throat> As a biophysicist, I'm interested in measuring the action, uh, the activity of those, those channels. Um, and I'll do that using a technique called patch clamps. So you think these ions moving across a membrane, ions moving across a membrane through a channel is exactly the same as electrons moving in a wire. And when electrons move from one place to another, they elicit a current, okay? And we can measure those currents using these techniques. Also, that difference in the number of ions on the outside and the inside, that, that force that wants to push the ions from one place to another, that's the same, that generates a voltage. So we've got voltages we can measure in the cells and we've got currents. And we can measure those readily in the lab using um, simple techniques, um, like lowering these glass micro electrodes onto a cell <clears throat> and recording the ion flow through these ion channels across the membrane. So, <clears throat> those cartoons of an electrode on the cell are simple, uh, but this is, just, this is what an electrophys rig would look like. This is the one where, the, uh, the, where CSF first ever met a GABA receptor with flamazenil. This is a, a picture from 10 years ago. This is the rig we use. It's a microscope, $20,000 worth of amplifiers. It sits on an anti-vibration table. Now, this entire setup costs about 100 grand to, to build. Um, and then to em employ the people to run it, that's going to take another 70,000 a year to operate. Um, <clears throat> and in my lab currently, we only have the one rig that's dedicated. It's been specialized to handle small volumes of CSF. Um, but with this kind of rig, we can, we can, we can measure these, uh, the, the flow of chloride ions through GABA receptors we can record from neurons, where we can record the, the action potential, this, this, this sudden activation of, of sodium channels, um, and potassium channels that occurs um, on, on the surface of a cell. And what's really interesting about things like the action potential, when a region membrane has that flow of, of, uh, of current, um, it doesn't just flow through one place and stop. It's like if you drop a water um, droplet into a cup, and you'll see the ripples, the waves, move away from the site where the, uh, the drop falls in. What current flow across the membrane is very similar. You'll get an initial site where it, where it happens, and then it'll spread out with time. So you, just like those waves moving away from a central spot. Membranes are like that. They'll carry these changes of, of, uh, of voltage. They don't stay local. They'll, they'll move away from the, from the initial uh, site. So we can. So here's these little waves of electricity flowing along membranes um, on a piece of these are, uh, presynaptic terminals arriving on a neuron. These little bursts of light are representing those changes, little changes in voltage as currents and voltages flow through the cell. Um, and we'll come back to that again in a second. Now, <clears throat> so the brain contains 85 billion neurons. That translates to about 10 to the power of 15, a million billion synapses um, in, the, in the human cell. 90% of those synapses are excitatory, where you see exciting signals. Um, only 10% are inhibitory. If you think of a Formula One race car, um, <clears throat> The driver's going to be on the gas 90% of the time. But when you hit a corner at 200 miles an hour, you very briefly need to use the brake, otherwise something's going to go awry. And your brain's the same way. Mostly excitation with a little bit of inhibition there to keep things under control. So <clears throat> let's talk about these neurotransmitters and uh, in, these, in these, uh, these synapses. So those <clears throat> waves of excitation arrive at these synapses. And if enough of those little flashes of light arrive at that, post, that big orange postsynaptic cell, you'll see that postsynaptic cell fire an action potential in response. So lots of little signals coming in, enough to arrive at the same time, boom, there it goes. You get that, that, that uh, the, the next uh, neuron in, the, in line will, uh, will fire. In more granular form, presynaptic, postsynaptic um, part of the synapse, and the synaptic cleft in the middle. <clears throat> 
matching potential is going to come down into the presynaptic cleft. Um, going to open up these voltage-gated calcium channels right here. These are the calcium ions on the outside. And when that action potential arrives, those calcium channels are going to flow into the presynaptic terminal, and that's going to cause vesicles of neurotransmitter that are in, on the inside of the, uh, of the terminal to fuse. There go, there go the chloride ions. Here are the vesicles, and they're going to merge with that presynaptic membrane, and when, they're going to, when they touch, they'll, they'll burst and, and release these neurotransmitter molecules that then flow out of the presynaptic cell, across the cleft. I hope you can see that. And then they flow across the cleft and then bind to postsynaptic receptors where they bind. When they do that, those channels open and allow ions to flow into the postsynaptic cell. And if enough of those ions are opened in an excitatory synapse, that's going to cause another depolarization and the flow of, uh, of voltage onto the next cell. And that's how cells communicate with one another at a synapse. To do that, <coughs> um, the typical GO signals would be glutamate, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, and the stop signals would be GABA and glycine. Just different small molecules binding to those postsynaptic receptors. So, to uh, illustrate that point again, there we go. In an excitatory synapse, you're going to have these vesicles of glutamate come out. Glucemic goes across the cleft, opens up these channels, and that allows a positive current to flow, positive ions to flow into the membrane, across the membrane, and that depolarizes the cell and sends on an action potential on its way. <coughs> that could be acetylcholine, that, that could be glutamate, or noradrenaline. Um, in an inhibitory synapse, you're going to have vesicles of GABA or glycine released. Same process, they'll merge with the, the presynaptic membrane, release those two chemicals into the cleft. They'll bind to postsynaptic GABA A receptors, where they'll control the flow of um, <coughs> chloride into the cell, causing electronegativity to win. So here's a GABA, postsynaptic uh, GABA receptor, allowing chloride ions to flow into the cell to um, inhibit the cell electrically. So, what is GABA? Um, <coughs> GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA stands for gamma amino butyric acid. Um, it's, a, it's a chemical signal carrying signals between two neurons, and it's associated with calming things down. So there's probably hundreds or thousands of, of uh, tens of thousands of, of, uh, of synapses on each neuron, and these can contain thousands of receptors themselves. Let's skip over this in the interest of time. So in, in, in GABA synapses, um, what you can see this again, GABA released into the cleft, binds to postsynaptic GABA A receptors, and that allows the flow, very briefly allows the flow of, of chloride across the membrane. We can record that using electrophysiology. Here's the recording of a current. When GABA hits the receptors, thousands of them together, the current turns on and rapidly goes away. And if you do that in the presence of here, let's have a neurosteroid, that inhibition takes longer. And there are some other important GABA receptors that exist away from the synapse. In the synapse, GABA is present for about a millisecond, then, then gets cleaned up. Outside, there's more of a neurohormonal effect of GABA, where it activates low, a low level of extrasynaptic receptors, and those can be important for, for sleep and sedation as well. So, a GABA receptor, a functional um, GABA receptor is made up of five proteins. Two molecules of GABA activate it, and it can be modulated by many different kinds of drugs. Benzodiazepines, as I said, and general anesthetics, steroids, and ethanol. And GABA receptors are genetically related to a whole bunch of other ligand-gated ion channels. Here's our ligand GABA. This is an ion channel. It's a receptor only one. So all of these proteins come together to form ligand-gated ion channels. So quick bit of pharmacology for you <clears throat> to m make sure you understand what the, how does modulation of these things um, uh, work. This little box here represents a GABA receptor and has our GABA molecule, the agonist. What can happen in your body is that agonist binds to that protein, and when that does that, it gives the protein sufficient energy to change shape. It goes from this long, thin thing to this blocky thing, and it also allows ions to flow through the, the membranes uh, depicted by this little lightning flash. If you add a competitive antagonist to this, the following thing happens. You can still have GABA binding and the, the, the channel um, activate, or instead, the antagonist drops into the site, stops GABA from getting in there, but the antagonist doesn't have the same effect as the agonist. It doesn't change the structure of the receptor at all. It just blocks the agonist from getting in, and this re receptor remains unaffected. In the case of um, 
modulation, uh, drugs like uh, the protein in NIH that makes you sleepy and drugs like propofol or benzodiazepines, the following thing can happen. When the modulator binds to the channel, nothing happens. It does nothing on its own. However, when your GABA comes along and binds, you don't get the normal amount of activation, you get a heck of a lot more. Okay? So the modulator doesn't activate the receptor, you just get a lot more activation per se. So it's a modulation, it's not the, 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 the orange square doesn't actually change, initiate the change in the protein structure. And what we're doing with flamazenil, if you imagine the modulator is your IH somnogen, the, 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 the endosapine, the, the chemical that's making you sleepy, that binds to your GABA receptors, GABA binds and gives you more inhibition. When flamazenil comes along, it blocks that binding site and takes you back to having a normal GABA A receptor. And that's what we're trying to do with, um, with flamazenil in IH. Okay, so that's all the basic terms I want to use the last part of the talk. I'll say this again. When positive allosteric modulators hit GABA receptors, you see two things. First of all, as you increase the concentration of a drug, this is an anesthetic, you see the duration of inhibition. We're recording the ions flowing through a whole bunch of, um, of, of, of channels in a synapse. As, as you increase the concentration of drug, so the duration of the, this, this spike, the, how fat it is, how wide it is, gets longer, and you see that the whole thing starts to drop downwards. So these are extrasynaptic receptors, and also the, the synaptic receptors themselves are getting, they're, they're not activating, um, being activated by the drug, they're just getting, they, they stay activated longer in the presence of the, of the drug. Now, when GABA goes wrong, you can get some fairly devastating um, diseases. Um, here's a review I wrote, we, wrote, we wrote recently with Steve Trinellis, and we looked at all the different mutations that, that were known at the time in GABA receptor genes. And when GABA receptors go wrong, here's a different group of GABA receptor genes, you end up with Alzheimer's disease, addiction, autism spectrum disorder, developmental delay, epilepsy, mental retardation, and schizophrenia. Um, mutations in, uh, in GABA receptors are uh, dangerous. <clears throat> so now let's talk about IH. We're here to talk about IH. We've covered GABA. Um, <clears throat> We all know this is an ex excessive daytime sleepiness, pr prolonged uh, uh, nocturnal sleep. Sleep is, is not restorative, psychostimulants don't work. We don't have an accepted genetic or chemical assay for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and we heard a lot how the problems with diagnosing the, the disease. Um, why GABA is important in IH, there's a very simplified um, cartoon here from a, from a lovely Nature Neuroscience paper telling us what we think very simplified might be happening in your brains right now. When you're awake, these different structures in the brains, and the names aren't important, are releasing alerting signals in, in, into other brain regions. You've really got serotonin, orexin, histamine, um, acetylcholine, norepinephrine being released into your brains, that's keeping your brains awake. In non-REM sleep, the ventrolateral preoptic area turns on and inhibits all of these nuclei with GABA. It sends a GABAergic signal into these, these synapses on these other nucleus, nuclei and say, stop, stop sending those arousing signals. And that's the importance of GABA. If you make GABA work harder, this little nuclei is going to have, be having much stronger effects um, on shutting down arousal in the brain. So winding back the clock, you know, 10 years or so, and that, 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 that fantastic day, in the lab where we, we, uh, we put an electrode on some cells that had GABA receptors in them. We put a little squirt of GABA on for two seconds. We see this lovely current gets activated. Wash it off, it goes away. We repeat that in the presence of CSF. We get this more than doubling of the current. Way more inhibition um, on that receptor in the presence of the CSF. The CSF on its own doesn't do anything. It does, doesn't have GABA, enough GABA in it to activate the channels. It just causes um, more inhibition. Um, we put flamazenil on, we stop that from working, washed out the flamazenil, and the currents all come back. Um, <clears throat> we did this for controls. As I said yesterday, the interesting thing is, um, this is common to all people. Everyone has a little bit of modulation in their brains. But it just occurs if you have idiopathic hypersomnia, with or without long sleep, um, and even narcolepsy without cataplexy, you can see a very variable range of effects, but for the most part, most of these patients have much more inhibition in their brains because there's something in their CSF that's making GABA receptors work harder. Um, <clears throat> these experiments are difficult to do, and I'll tell you why. Um, here's an experiment my last grad student performed. She's using different concentrations of GABA here to activate different um, size currents. And then she repeated that with CSF, 
Now, what we've known for, for a long time is how much enhancement you get is dependent on how much GABA you're using. Low GABA will give you a little enhancement. The bigger the GABA concentration, so the enhancement goes away. You can even get inhibition. And she plotted that here. Here's the amount of GABA she's using. Here's the amount of enhancement the CSF is giving her. And the higher you go, the less enhancement you get. <clears throat> um, we were criticized by another lab um, saying that they, they didn't see CSF working on GABA receptors. And we thought, that's strange. We've done it 600 times now. Um, news to me. Um, what we, we looked at the paper more carefully. Well, first, first of all, we repeated our experiments with a collaborating lab in Australia. Um, CSFs are great. You can put them in the mail and mail them half a way around the world, and they work just fine when they get to the other end. So we had to verify our work in Joe's lab. And then we took a, um, a, what happens to GABA receptors when you activate them for, with high concentrations of GABA? You get this desensitization. You don't get this nice smooth peak. You get this much sharper peak, and the currents turn off. And the more GABA you use, so the more desensitization, the bigger this, this decrement gets. So we made a standard curve for, for our receptors. And we went back and looked at the other, the other group's data, and we were able to work out that they were using very, very high concentrations of GABA where they would never, ever see the enhancement. So I stand by all of our work. And we, we published a rebuttal to that work. So, but as I said yesterday, those kind of rebuttals take time. That took months and months of work in the lab to work out how um, to, to best address uh, uh, these, these, uh, these criticisms, which were unfounded. <clears throat> so what's new in, 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 uh, in our IH research? Well, we've come to the conclusion that the term endozapine might be a little bit misleading. We can make GABA receptors that are insensitive to benzodiazepines. We can make mutations in the protein. We can leave out, leave out part of the binding site. And you put on, here's GABA activating a current right here. Turn it off. It goes away. You add the CSF, and you still get enhancement on a, on a receptor that doesn't have a benzodiazepine binding site. So what I think we think now is there has to be part of the benzodiazepine machinery there, but a fully in, um, functional site is not important. Um, I love this quote from Louis Pasteur. In science, fortune favors the prepared mind. This goes to the question we got yesterday about no, how do we pick the experiments that we do. Um, our index patient, uh, uh, this, this is literally how clarithromycin came into our world. Uh, our index patient, she was on um, flamazenil, um, was prescribed a macrolide antibiotic when she got bronchitis. Now, this is a woman who would sleep for two days at a time. You're mostly familiar uh, with this story. But when she took clarithromycin, she had then experienced a bout of insomnia for four days. I know many of you would crave four days of insomnia right now. Um, and we thought, well, that's strange. But then we paused and wondered, is it that strange? When you look at um, different antibacterials and mycobacterials, um, they are Many of them are associated with sleep disturbances, anxiety, seizures. In fact, when penicillin was discovered in the early parts of the 20th century, it was used in the trenches in the Somme. Doctors would pour this, 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 uh, this precious um, uh, chemical into bullet holes in, in soldiers' brains, and they would elicit a seizure. It was blocking GABA receptors so readily. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it, it was known for a very long time that penicillins block, GABA, block um, uh, inhibitory receptors. And sure enough, we go back into the lab. We, we, uh, we activate some GABA receptors here. Um, clarithromycin on its own does nothing. When you co-apply GABA with clarithromycin, it blocks the activation of the channels. Um, <clears throat> and that's another way of showing that kind of data. And sure enough, if you um, do the similar experiments we showed before, my box is involved, GABA, GABA and hypersomnic CSF, big increase. Co-apply clarithromycin, you block the extra enhancement. This is why clarithromycin might be useful in getting um, in treating some of the symptoms of sleepiness of IH modulators via GABA receptors. Now, in the double-blind um, clinical trial, as we heard yesterday, the objective measures of sleepiness we found them to be not significant. But patients said they felt a lot better when they're taking clarithromycin. So, again. What objective measures of sleepiness do we, should we be using? And, uh, and again, these are flawed. These are patients want to feel better on these drugs. How do we better determine how well our drugs are working? Right, so that's the, um, the, the state of the art um, in the lab as we've come up to now. What, what's happening um, in, in the future? Well, 
Um, one area of concern um, is that uh, you know many neuroscience companies have been closing their drug pipelines. That's being kicked out to small labs like mine to come up with to take to bear the risk of discovering new compounds. It's uh, it's, it's a different it's a different uh, mechanism. Hopefully we can um, be successful as the big, as big pharma. Um, reason for this: developing new uh, drugs is slow and it's expensive. Um, and I think we're behoven to find uh, faster and cheaper alternatives. Um, some of my, my points have uh, disappeared on here, but um, the point I wanted to make was um, when we know there are side effects associated with other drugs out there that are already approved for other disorders, like clarithromycin. We need to be clever in the lab and find those compounds that we know can have um, arousal um, effects as a side effect and then bring them into the IH field to help um, uh, restore sleepiness. Um, so, um, here it is, the Patcher bot. You're going to be the amongst the first people to see this incredible um, uh, result, this collaboration between the group at Georgia Tech and my lab at Emory. So, on a good day, um, I could get 20, I can record 20 cells if I'm lucky. But here we are, no human being in the room. That robot is landing electrodes on cells, patching them, making some recordings, picks up the electrode, cleans it, goes back in and recognizes another cell. Here it is, on, onto the cell it goes, boom, make some recordings, get out, clean, go back, go back in again, boom, go and get another cell. This, what you're seeing in this video would take me a day. And it's, it's sped up by a factor of two, but this is an enormous breakthrough. What we realize we can do, we can actually for the first time two years ago, we were cleaning patch clamp electrodes for the very first time. Someone doesn't have to come in, take the electrode off, put a new one on, go and find the cell, manually land that electrode onto that little cell in the dish under the microscope. Then we can go on and on and on. Um, the, new, the next generation of these will have four electrodes going after four cells at the same time, and we plan to put four of those things on a bench together. That setup, the four quad bots will record could determine the effect of a thousand CSF samples in a week. We could also do a smaller number of CS, uh, patient samples, but then determine which one of the five drugs that are important for um, IH um, will, will, will block activity on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, also, we, we can bring to bear um, um, on, uh, under the robot, and we were doing this already manually, is I can, we can take your skin cells we can, um, with, with the, the, this is with the, in collaboration with Dr. Bissell is in the back of the room, can take skin cells, take them back to being pluripotent stem cells, then send them down a neuronal lineage. We can actually grow your neurons in the lab. We can take your CSF and put those on the cells as well. So your, your, your neurons are now bathed in your CSF, and we can take our, um, our cells that we normally put our receptors in, and we can add to that a little protein signal that says, make a synapse. And we put our, our transfected cells into these cultures so we know what proteins are in the postsynaptic cell. And we can then land our electrode, because you see the electrode in this micrograph here. And we can listen to what your synapses are, would, would be sounding like in your brains right now. We can get in there and get drugs. Here's an example of this. And we're recording. Um, our <clears throat> just li listening to this hex cell here. And it's, and it's got the synaptic input from, from, from neurons around it. And you see these little bursts of current. This, this is what. A, a, a human, this is, this, in this case, this is a rodent neuron talking to um, a human protein uh, receptor. So we can rebuild your brains in our lab. And then finally, um, you saw this, this, uh, this slide yesterday in David's talk, this volcano plot. Each one of these dots is a unique and novel peptide that is floating around in your brains that hasn't been characterized before, that's associated um, with, it's correlated with excessive sleepiness. Um, working out which one of these dots represents the somnogen, the thing that's giving us all the trouble in our heads, is going to take an awful long time. There are, this, is, this is just the top 2,000. And the, the, the guys in the proteomics core are coming up with more and more of these every day. We need the robot to help us determine which one of these upregulated or downregulated proteins is causing the problem um, in sleepiness. So what I've tried to go over the last um, half an hour or so, um, you should now be more familiar with how brain cells communicate with one another, why GABA is important, why it's important in IH, and we're getting closer to understanding what causes it, and we have a better test bed for coming up with new therapies to block those interactions.
So I want to say thank you, first of all, to all of you for generously providing your CSF and your time and your unique perspective on this disorder. Speaking to people with this disease is, is it's critical for the scientists and the physicians to understand your experience, especially the scientists, because we don't meet patients very often. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank um, David, Diane, and Hi the uh, Cat Rye and uh, the Hi uh, Hypersomnia Foundation for uh, putting this meeting together. It's a unique uh, chance of, of meeting of minds. Um, and my colleagues in the Sleep Center, we're funded by the Marigold Foundation and the NIH. Um, and also, um, thank you to Balance Pharmaceuticals for um, licensing um, our, our technologies um, and taking them to a broader market. Thank you. I don't think I ever ran. Thank you. Thank you.